Hello everyone, this is Jeff Gray and uh, welcome to our second in a series of webinars that is sponsored by the advisory board and the COIS uh, Center. So thanks for joining us tonight. I think we've got a really good uh, topic for you know the tribe member because a couple years ago Dr. Coyce came to me and said you know Jeff we're teaching everybody how to do great dentistry but I'm really worried that that's not translating into doing it in their office and so like we all know they kind of told us a lie in dental school when they said if you're a really good dentist you'll have a really good practice and I think most of us know that that's probably not true it doesn't do any good to be a great dentist if no one knows where your office is or no one knows about you or they can't find you. And I think you'll find today that more and more people are searching either your website or your reviews online to find a good place to go. There's lots of patients left that still want quality work. They want the kind of work that you are all capable and we are all capable of doing. And I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, Rusty Curtis will be the first speaker. He's been an amazing help to our office on our website. And I've given him permission to use both the good and bad parts of our website so that you guys could learn. Uh, and then Lane Anderson will speak second. He's the one who does all of our search engine optimization and all those other fancy computer words that I have no idea what he actually does, but it works. We actually, on our website, get about a 9 to 10 to 1 return. That means for every dollar I spend on the website, I get $10 back. So that is a great thing. Our number one source of new patients in the last decade has been from our online, and that's all due to the work that Lane Anderson has done. Um, I trust these guys 100%. And I've been very thankful to work with both of them. They both deliver more than I've asked for. They're really intelligent. They won't be selling you guys anything tonight. They just want to help you build your practices and be better dentists by being able to do the work that John has taught us to do. So thanks again for joining. And uh, Rusty, if you want to go ahead, we'd love to have you start sharing with the group. and. Uh, making our phone ring tomorrow and get some more people in the door. Imagine everybody, if you could just get five or six better new patients a month, what that would do for your practice. And Lane and Rusty, I think, can give you some ideas to tweak your own website or have your guys tweak your website or they would be happy to consult with you too. So thanks and take it away, Rusty. Thanks for the introduction, Jeff. And I'm going to make a, a brief little statement. I'm so appreciative to work with Jeff and Dennis like him and I'm, I'm also appreciative that he gave me permission to pick on him tonight. Don't worry, we're not going to make him look bad or anything. Just show some before and afters. And also I wanted to, to thank Jeff and his wife for really helping to instill uh, in me a deep love for the true life-changing uh, skills that you offer to people. Mary, Jeff's wife, a while back told me a story about a wife who just came into the into their office into Jeff's office in tears thanking them because Jeff gave her her husband back so I guess the husband had let his his oral health deteriorate to the point where he wouldn't go to family activities he wouldn't smile he wouldn't even kiss his wife and when Jeff utilized sedation dentistry and helped him it, it brought him back to life and his family is so appreciative and that was a defining moment for me for really recognizing truly how big of an impact quality dentistry can make in changing people's lives. So that was a brief little thank you and appreciation for the, the dental community, in particular you, you wonderful Coys guys. So as you know we're going to be talking about cutting a path through the internet jungle tonight and in particular how to use dental marketing to attract and convert your ideal patient. And there's a lot of patients out there but what both Lane and I kind of uh, specialize in is helping you to find those types of patients that can be long-term, enjoyable, quality patients. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Now, as you saw from the announcement, we were going to briefly discuss the types of changes that we've seen in the online world in the last 18 months. So let me hop into this here. Now, there are two major talking points as far as major changes that we've seen in the last eight months. The first one 
which you're probably already familiar with, is mobile device ownership. Now here's a chart I pulled from the Pew Research Institute. They're very reliable with their data. And just look at that change. The, the two lines you're going to look at here are the black line right in the middle of that graph and the red line. That black line is smartphone ownership. Now you can see back in January 13 uh, that we were about roughly mid-40s percent of U.S. adults who own a smartphone, so in the mid-40s. Just since then, we're already encroaching on the, the high 50s, 60 range. So the growth of mobile phone or smartphone usage is just off the charts, basically shooting up. And the same thing with the red line. That's the tablet usage. Now, why this is so important to call out, we're going to get to the impact of this here in a couple slides, but keep those numbers in mind. You can see that the desktop ownership is fairly static, but that mobile and tablet phone usage is what we want to talk about, or the tablet usage. Also, broadband internet access. This is an old chart. It capped out in 2013, but it still shows you a pretty good trend line for what's going. This is broadband internet access. Now, if you live in a more affluent area or in a, in a little bit higher, you know, higher end area, that line is obviously going to be a lot higher as far as who has access to um, broadband internet. Here's an interesting stat for you. In May 2013, 49% U.S. adults checked for directions, recommendations, or other location-based information on their cell phone. Almost half of people on their cell phone were looking for these. And guess what? Dennis, being a brick-and-mortar business, that's going to be you guys. That's going to be people trying to find a local business to visit, whether it's medical services, a restaurant, shoes, you name it. So that's going to include you. Now, what this means, these two things we talked about, about the increase in mobile and tablet ownership, as well as uh, the broadband, is responsive website design. I'm going to show you exactly what that is on the next slide and why that's important to you. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about how this increase in broadband usage has allowed you to put more rich content on your website, to be more engaging, more attractive, more persuasive. So on the responsive website design, here's where we're going to start picking on Jeff a little bit. Now here is what his website would look like on a desktop right now. And I'm going to switch screens here and show you in a little bit. But this is a depiction of it on a desktop computer. Now what responsive design does is the underlying code of the site tells the website and the content to respond automatically to the dimensions of the device that accesses it. Now what that means in layman's terms is if you pull that up on a tablet, it's automatically going to resize itself to still be readable and legible, but be on a smaller device. So there's an example of an iPad, and then obviously on a smartphone. And it'll size down so that'll be quick and easy to see on a smartphone. Now here is a brief example. Let me pull this up for you real quick just to show you. Now here is Jeff's old website. This is what it looks like. Maybe you may see something like this or have something like this. Now what I'm going to do is size down the window and watch what happens to the website content as I size down this window. You're going to see that that content doesn't adjust. It just gets cut off of the screen. Now what that means is if somebody, and you've probably done this before, if you try to pull up this website on your phone, what's going to happen is the website code is going to tell all of the content on this page to look the same but shrink all the way down to fit on a phone and it's not readable. So what you end up doing is playing kind of the thumb war game with the phone trying to expand it and blow it up in the site that, in the position that you want and that is uh, what we're talking about when I'm talking about responsive design. So here's the example of, this is the after. So this is for you uh, before and after people who like your, your case studies. So here's what we did for him when he needed his site to go responsive. You can see a little more visually engaging. Here's Jeff's beautiful face right when you pull it up. Talks about the five-star service. And again, we emphasize the recommendations and the reviews. Now when I size this down, watch what happens to the content. It may be a little jumpy on your side, but I'll go slow. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. You see everything just sized down? Now this would be almost the dimensions of what you would see on your iPad or your tablet when you pull it up. We can keep sizing down, and this may be what you see on one of those really big Droid phones. 
you size it down more and here would be your typical iPhone. So that's called responsive design. And the reason that's so important is when you've got, you know, potentially half of the people in your area just right now that are trying to access your website via mobile, you want it to be as optimized as possible and easy to navigate. And one thing in particular we did for Jeff is you notice right here at the top what people are looking for when they go for the site is the phone number. They can click here for a map or an email. So this is the information they're looking for. And if you pull this up on a phone, you can even click that number and it'll directly call his, his uh, office phone. So that is what responsive design looks like. Put this back up. Okay, now we talked about content richness and what that means. Because of the broadband internet ubiquity, because people have access to it, that allows you to put higher res images, you can embed video, you can do more interesting content layout, and people have the bandwidth to be able to view that. So basically it's taking advantage of the internet speeds that people have. So video, embed, nice high definition, uh, welcome video treatment. And let's go down to the next tier. Photography, make sure to use nice high resolution and vivid photos. I'll show you a couple examples later. And then for text layout, again, try to avoid the, the novel format. Break it up into sections, use bullets, use coloring. The really neat thing is you can actually use different fonts as far as formatting. If you've got a custom font, you can embed that in your website and use it. So again, the point is engaging people when they hit your website. And uh, you just saw Jeff's site as the example there. Get through. Now, one thing that I typically kind of have a conversation with about our dentists when they first call in is to really understand the importance of what your website or your digital presence actually is and what it can do for you. So the, the best way to think about your website is your digital front office. Now, you know, I don't know how much time each one of you has spent with your front office girls trying to train them and to get make the best first impression possible that they can. My wife, when we first got married, was hired at a local college to be their first director of first impressions. So it's a big deal what people's first impression is, and you know that as well. And you may use that when you're speaking with your patients as well about the importance of having a nice smile to make a good first impression. And the same thing applies to you. It's important that you have a nice smile, but also their interaction with you. And your website is fantastic because you can do it perfect every time. You don't have to worry about your front office girl having a bad day on the website. You've got the perfect first impression every time. That goes for your website as well as your video. And you can think of a welcome video to your practice as an introduction, a personal, warm, friendly introduction to you. So take advantage of those. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about not only do you want to use this content on your website, but you want to make the most of it. Right, so on a video, let's talk about some quick do's and don'ts. If you have a videographer you can work with, we offer those services, or if you do it yourself, here are some tips when you do that. Do engage emotionally. Don't bore the audience. That's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. So you know about the importance of, in sales or in persuasion, of trying to engage with them emotionally. You want to impress them with quality. Every sort of touch point that your patients or potential patients have with you or your practice needs to impress them with the quality of dentistry that Coy's doctors offer. You guys do phenomenal work and that needs to come through in your marketing materials. Don't cheapen your services. You guys offer fantastic quality services. Don't try to you know, emphasize discounts by coming or half price dental. Focus on the quality. Also establish credibility. Great way to do this if you have video is to have maybe one of your patients do a testimonial. So bring them in the office, record them doing a testimonial. Lane's going to talk a little bit about the tremendous SEO value that video has. And uh, don't be an, an egomaniac. You know, people want to know that you're good and they'd like to hear from your patients, but a two-minute video talking about how wonderful you are might not rub some patients that well. And another huge thing that we try to do, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this with, you know, what we did for Jeff's sedation microsite, is you really want 
the patients to feel comfortable with you. Focus on how you take the time and how your team takes the time to make sure that the, the patient is comfortable through every single step of the visit at the practice. And uh, you know, the opposite side of that is, is don't terrify them with, uh, with any of the clinical things that uh, they might not like. Lane and I have to talk about this frequently, you know, and I'll show you the, the photo here as an example just to, to drive it home. Actually, let's do this real quick. And instead of me talking, explaining this, this is an example video that we did for a dentist up in Westland, Oregon. I'm going to cut it a little bit short, but I want to visually represent what I'm talking about here. And, and put yourself in the shoes of a mom or a dad who's trying to find a dentist for themselves or for their family and what they're looking for. Now, put yourself in that mindset and watch this video. Now, I'll give you a warning in advance. The audio might be a little bit choppy because of our connection to go to meeting, but you know, keep with it here, and if, uh, if the audio is not working, you can mute it. But here you go. Hi, I'm Matt Rohn, and I'm the dentist here at Rome Family Dental in West Bend, Oregon. Right as we're talking about broadband internet access and the speed that people have. Westland is a great little community south of Portland. It's beautiful. It's scenic here. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to be a dentist. Oh, that's great. So, there are a lot of dentists in the Portland area, and I think one reason that uh, the people want to come here is because we treat them like family. We know our patients by name. We care about all of our patients, and it's really important for us to build long-term relationships your smile really is the first thing people notice about you, and it's often the last thing they remember. And we really take that to heart. I enjoy coming to the dentist, which is the first time that uh, I've ever been able to say that. It's just a really good atmosphere, and the people here are just so amazing. I got some porcelain veneers, and um, they turned out really well, and I'm super happy with them. One thing I notice is when you walk in, there's no frustration from the staff. You feel extremely relaxed during the process. I'd have time to ask questions. He would take a moment to explain them in detail, very professional, and then also very simplistic. I came in for tooth cleaning and met Dr. Rowan, and he couldn't have been nicer. He was very professional and personable, and I just felt very comfortable with him. We understand that our patients are busy and don't have time to come back for multiple dental appointments. We have invested in technology that will offer the highest quality dental care in much shorter appointments. Oftentimes, your treatment can be completed in one short appointment. At the end of the day, we don't just want you to have a great dental experience. We want you to leave with the smile that you've always deserved. So there you go, guys. There's a lot of things I'd like to call out on that, but if you were thinking about that as if you were the patient trying to find a dentist, how impressive is that? It talks about the quality of the dentistry. It talks about building relationships and how comfortable they are in the office. And I mean, can you pay for better testimonials than somebody saying, yeah, there was no frustration, or I used to be scared of the dentist and now I'm not. That is so powerful. And that's one thing, again, that I've been so impressed with Jeff, and I think it's a good time now to show his microsite, which is another website strategy on sedation dentistry. Now, you'll see this is his main website. This is called a microsite, and it's a completely separate website that focuses specifically on sedation dentistry. And the strategy here is in people in San Diego, if they're looking for sedation dentistry or being able to relax at the dentist, because the content is so focused on that term and that geography, it can rank well, as well as when they actually arrive on the site, it answers all their questions they know that you take the treatment seriously, 
and Jeff derives a lot of sedation dentistry from this microsite. And you can see the terms, sedation dentistry, get your life back. We can completely change how you feel about visiting the dentist. These are emotional pleas to the people to help them feel relaxed and trust Jeff. Another story Mary told me is that one of their patients was coming into the dentist and she had such intense dental phobia that when she was around the corner from Jeff's office, she literally jumped out of the car and ran the opposite direction. That's how terrified some people are of the dentist. And it's sad, but true. So if you can emphasize how comfortable they will be, that'll help alleviate those fears. So that is talking about the, the uh, microsites and also showed you the video. So now let's go back into talking about photos. Now again, we're talking about making sure to use compelling, rich, dynamic content on your website. So here's a great example of a do and don't. Here's a nice, attractive, believable model. This is a stock photo, but look how rich it is and engaging. Look at the eyes, look at the pleasant smile. Very engaging and very pleasant feeling. This is what I would encourage you not to use. Try to avoid the hands in the mouth with dental instruments you know, photos. That may depict dentistry, but people are wanting the benefits of dentistry. They're not excited about looking at sharp metal objects in their mouth. They want to feel relaxed. They want to be able to go out and enjoy life with friends and be able to confidently smile. So focus on the benefits with your imagery as well as your videos and not necessarily a clinical depiction of what they'll be experiencing in the dental practice. As far as your text, try to follow the same guidelines. Focus on benefits. If you watch Apple commercials or people that really have their advertising done well, it focuses on how much better it will make your life or how much more convenient or improving the quality of life. Don't focus on features. As soon as you start playing that game of just focusing on features and maybe what technology you offer that somebody else doesn't, even though that's a good thing to mention, but if that becomes your focus, you're turning yourself into a commodity. And then in most shoppers' blinds, as they're getting savvier, they're going to say, okay, who's a dentist in the area? Who's another one that does the same service for less? So keep the focus on benefits and quality. Educate them. Don't pontificate. You can tell them about a service, but there's no, there's no reason to go into a thesis on, you know, occlusion or, or how you're better at it or your specific technique is is you know the best and how you've done all this clinical research on it. You may want to mention that for credibility, but don't let that be the focus. Euphemisms. I train my writers on this frequently. When you're talking about placing a dental implant, that's what you want to say. I tell my writers to say something along the lines of, we will, if they're writing content for a dentist, we will gently place a permanent um, implant in your mouth below the gum line so that your beautiful restoration can be placed on it. You want to stick with that instead of saying we're going to scalpel your gum open, drill down into your jawbone, and crank down a screw into your jawbone. So put it nicely. You know, people want to know what the service is and you can explain the service without scaring them or without making them squirm. So try to think of pleasant ways to, to share what you're doing but not terrify them. Also, just as far as formatting, make sure to organize the, the text and break it up so it's easy to digest. People want information now. And so if they feel that they have to read three paragraphs of content to find what they're looking for, you know, there's a good chance they might bounce, go to a different page, or go to a different dentist website, and you don't want that. So avoid the novel format on the text. Now I'm going to wrap up with uh, just a little bit of kind of pointers if you're going to be writing content for yourself or try to assign somebody to the office to do this. If you're writing content for Google, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, speculation. Google doesn't tell you exactly uh, what they say, but as far as what they're looking for, but you want to have unique text. Google frowns on duplicate content, which simply is text copied from another website and placed on yours. The way Google works, it's like a giant filing cabinet. What they do is they send out their little, they're called bots, or these little programs that go and read websites, and what they do is they file away the content of your website in a giant digital you know, filing cabinet. And when somebody performs a search 
Google goes to that filing cabinet and tries to find the things that they deem as relevant for that search and then delivers the results. If you've got duplicate content, that will hurt you, and that's one way that you may not rank high or you'll rank low if you have duplicate content. Again, this isn't a hard, fast rule, but this is what we find work uh, or works. We try to write at least 300 words per page. So if you're talking about dental implants or dental veneers or Invisalign, try to write at least 300 words so Google knows you have serious content there. And then that last item about keyword density, what that is is a, a keyword, you can see the example right afterwards, San Diego Cosmetic Dentist. That would be considered a keyword, and Lane's going to talk about this more. But for every 300 words, you're going to want to use a keyword that you want to be found for about six to nine times. So again, this may be overwhelming. Don't let it, you know, don't let it overwhelm you. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about it. But I just wanted to give you some pointers for how to write content for Google, how to engage your ideal patients, what a good video would look like, what good photos look like, and also responsive design and the importance of that to be mobile ready for this massive swell of mobile searchers that you have. Because you guys are awesome dentists and we want to help patients go to you instead of the chop shops or people who don't take dentistry as seriously as you. So that would be my segment, and Lane is going to have some fantastic information about his search engine uh, practices that he does for his dentist. All right. Um, it's great to be with you today, and uh, appreciate this opportunity to um, share some information with you. I'm going to switch over the screen here, and um, I uh, just want to mention to you there are uh, there's a place down on your control panel that allows you to ask any questions you'd like. So if something comes to mind as we're talking through, either for Rusty or for me, feel free to just jot those uh, notes in on the the question panel. We'll try and get to as many of those as we can uh, at the end here. Um, I have a great respect for uh, the work that all of you do and the training that you've had. And um, this that we're talking about today is really providing an opportunity to reach more people who will uh, are well targeted to understand and appreciate um, what you've got to offer them. Um, Rusty's talked a lot about how to create a, a really effective website that will be persuasive and convey your practice well. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is how to get people there and how to convert them. So there are really three essential elements to successful internet marketing. Search, um, then being able to convert those people who contact your office, and then there's a really essential element that um, we'll talk about as well, which is tracking the results, doing some analysis, and understanding how to refine that marketing so that it works especially well. Let me talk a little bit about each of those. Search marketing um, is something that you know has come to the fore in the last decade or so, and it's really changed the marketing dynamic a great deal. We've done a lot of mass marketing over the years, as you know, and, and that required a dentist to go out and blanket the market with advertising in a newspaper or on TV or radio, um, maybe even direct mail, and, and would reach a lot of people who weren't interested and hope to find a few prospects that were. So it's basically a one-to-many kind of approach to reaching people and required something that would interrupt uh, and get their attention. Search marketing takes that equation and turns it around 180 degrees. Basically takes the prospect who is interested in what you have to offer, they go online to search and are trying to find the dentist. So it's really many to one trying to locate something they're looking for and the key is just to have something that's inviting and, and what encourages them to come in. So you've got people out there all the time that are searching online 24 hours a day, um, the job that we have is to be visible online at the right time and then follow up in the right way to convert them to become new patients. So as we look at a search page, there are several places that we can be visible on a search page. You've got the paid advertising or what we call pay-per-click advertising. 
there is search engine optimization, which are the organic listings. And then there are usually some local listings that are directory listings down at the bottom. Question is, do you need all three of those, or can we rely just on one? And the answer is, you're better off uh, to be using all three strategically. Here's how I would look at these contributing to the whole. Um, with search engine optimization, you're working on these organic listings. These are the listings that show up on the left side of the search page um, below those three paid ads. And we're optimizing or targeting certain keywords that have your location attached to them. A cosmetic dentist, San Diego, California. Um, and, and you're trying to show up in those listings for keywords that have a geographic location attached to it. There are a lot of other things that help search engine optimization. Um, blogs are one that put new content on your site, keep it fresh, and encourage the um, search engines to come back. Microsites that Rusty mentioned can be very helpful in getting a lot of focused content uh, on the site. And um, video is another one that's, that can be very helpful, that can provide even another listing on that same page. So. Um, all those things can, can help with search engine optimization. The pay-per-click advertising, if you think about spreading a net where you can be visible to people, this broadens it even further so that you can just target the core keywords, like if somebody just types in cosmetic dentist. If you're only doing search engine optimization, you're going to miss those people that just type in that core keyword. And then in addition, you go ahead and put in those location-specific keywords because studies have shown that if you're showing up more than one time on the search page, it's, there's some synergy in that. And it will cause a greater click-through rate to your website than the sum of those parts if they just had one or the other. So the more visibility on that page, the better off you're going to be. The third element are the local listings, and these are the directory listings in Google, Yahoo, Bing, a number of others. Um, what you're trying to accomplish with these is consistency across the Internet. They call it NAP, which stands for your name, address, and phone. And you want to have that appear the same way wherever you are on the Internet. Um, the value of that is then the search engines recognize your practice when it's listed there and give you credit for that. Even little changes in how your name's presented um, or how the address is, is listed can, can cause them to not um, recognize those. And then going in and enhancing that information on those local listings um, makes a big difference so that when consumers get there, they see... Uh, learn a little bit more about your practice. And patient reviews, if we were to talk about an area that has changed the most dramatically in the last 18 months, it would be in the area of patient reviews. Let me share a few things with you, why these matter so much. Um, there was a study done last year, a local consumer review survey done by Bright Local. They found that 85% of Internet users read online reviews about local businesses. And 79% trust them as much as personal recommendations uh, for certain businesses if there are multiple reviews and they're authentic. Let me show you some of this data. This uh, came from the study. And what's interesting about this, this these are the three-year trends, 2011, 12, and 13. And these are the various categories for which people uh, feel that reputation matters the most when they're picking a business. You notice that restaurant cafe, restaurants and cafes used to be the highest. Doctors and dentists now have eclipsed even restaurants and cafes as being that reputation being extremely important. Then, um, which of these business types have you read online customer reviews for? Still very heavy for restaurants, cafes, but dentists and doctors, the next highest category for which people read local reviews. So important to have that content there. And then, whoops, 
Um, do you trust online consumer reviews as much as personal recommendations? And you can see here, yes, if there are multiple customer reviews to read, so it's important to have quantity there, that they know this isn't just um, you know, the, the staff and a few family members. There's a credible number there. Um, if they believe that the reviews are authentic and, and for certain types of business, you can see that the number that don't feel like they trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations is about 21%. 79% do feel that they are important. So you see the tremendous importance that, that those local reviews have now. Um, two years ago, probably not so much. What's happened is a major consumer shift in behavior, and now they go and, and check those reviews. Share an interesting story with you. My um, daughter was had a new baby and needed to find a pediatrician. She had a personal recommendation from a friend, which you would think would carry quite a bit of weight. First thing she did was went online and read the reviews. Unfortunately, it was a doctor that hadn't paid much attention to his online reputation. And the people that had left reviews were the ones that were disgruntled and unhappy. And uh, they were so bad, the reviews, that she uh, went and found another doctor. And I think that kind of behavior is now um, occurring online regularly. So um, all the reviews aren't equal. Um, a review on Google is going to be the most valuable to you. Um, Yelp has now signed agreements with Bing and Yahoo, as well as Siri for the iPhone. And so they're becoming um, much more a presence online. Certainly the reviews in Yahoo would be um, additionally important. One of the things that's happened within the last uh, 30 days or so is that uh, Yelp reviews are now showing up on Yahoo, and so um, you've got um, some added importance there, of course. So we um, drive people to the website. Uh, Rusty's talked about a lot about how to create an effective website. Um, the key thing here now is to how do we go about converting those people who come to your website? Well, this click to conversion is a fairly simple process in theory. We're simply attracting searchers to the website through carefully targeted keywords that attract people the way the kind of patient that you want for your practice. The, we turn website visitors into leads and we convert the leads into patients. Seems all pretty simple in theory. But Every step along the way, the consumers are making decisions. So we call this a conversion funnel. You start out with a number of searchers who are looking for the services you have to offer. We measure click-through rate to determine how many of those choose to click on your listings. The visitors that then come to the website make a decision whether they're going to contact the office. So that's kind of a first-level conversion rate. And those become leads, uh, either phone calls or emails to the office. Now, a certain proportion of those people are going to make a decision whether or not they're going to make an appointment with your office after talking to someone at the front desk, another level of conversion. And then uh, hopefully you have an opportunity to bring them in, uh, present them a treatment plan, and then they're going to make a decision whether um, to accept treatment and become a paying patient. So you look at that process here from search to becoming a paying patient, and people are falling out of the process along that way. What you want to do is to keep as many people engaged with you and, and in that process as possible so that um, they become good paying patients. And there um, are certainly a number of website aids that will help that conversion. Rusty's talked a lot about a, an attractive website that's mobile friendly. Um, you can have 25 to 50 percent of your viewers that are on mobile devices. If that's a great experience, that will help them to move through. Um, I'd say 15 months ago, um, we would see maybe 10 percent of the traffic that was coming through um, on smartphones. Um, today we see the smartphone portion of that uh, mobile traffic at about 25 percent and leads are coming through 
those mobile devices now where we didn't see it that much uh, even a year ago. Mostly patients who are coming in to get a phone number or an address. Now uh, people are actually doing searches and, and uh, contacting the office. Action paths on the website are very important. Um, having a place that people can easily contact you, the phone number being very prominent where you can see it easily. Um, we have a tool that we put on our website. It's called a click to call. You just click on this little button and enter a phone number, and it takes the per it connects them with the office on that phone. Um, we found if by doing analysis across offices that phone calls will convert a lot better than a lead will that's sent through the website. So we do everything we can to encourage people to call where they can be on the phone with somebody while they're in the moment and thinking about it and uh, don't have to be chased down or potentially go to another office before we reach them. Promotional offers are another way to help conversion, and, and the idea here is not to give away the, the store. It's really just to give them some incentive to come in to the office, and usually they'll have a great experience once they come in your office, but it's just a little bit of an incentive to, uh, to come in and, and meet the team. Here's some office best practices to aid conversion that we have seen make a big difference. Um, answering the phone and emails promptly. I'll show you some interesting data in just a second about the importance of immediacy and getting to people right away. Um, talking to people about value, not price. Um, I, as I have seen practices that uh, are trained by COIS, they offer a lot of value and people will often call and not be thinking in terms of dentistry varying from office to office, and so they're calling and saying, how much is a crown or how much is a dental implant, and not realizing that they may not be getting apples to apples between offices. So a team that can really focus on, hey, um, let me tell you a little bit about our practice and, and why this would be a great dental home for you will make a difference. Third is asking for the appointment. That's a very simple thing, but um, boy, it makes a huge difference in how many people respond and agree to come in. And then follow up. Um, just following up more than once with people, they, the thing that is different about internet marketing is that people have expressed interest in talking to your team and, and uh, contacting your office. And so when we're, we rigorously follow up, it's simply responding to their request. And a lot of dental teams we find are reluctant to follow up more than once or twice. That can make a difference in your um, conversion rate. Let me just show you an interesting, um, some interesting data um, that we found from analysis across practices. We looked at all of the leads that had been converted. In other words, people who contacted the office and became patients. 57% of those that became new patients were contacted the same day. 21% of them the first day after, 5% the second day after, and 5% the third day after. You can see the how that curve diminishes the further you get out. That being said, we have often we have seen patients convert even three and four weeks out, and so it's important to follow up, but your conversion rate will improve immensely if your team will get right back to people as quickly as possible. Um, that'll make a difference. Um, let's talk a little bit about tracking. Um, very often in internet marketing, there's a lot of tracking that goes on online. The problem is the results are really in what happens in your office that help you to know what's going on. So there's online analytics that give us keywords, search engines, um, geographic locations sometimes that they searched from, a lot of information about their behavior, but then there's all the offline conversion data, and then the number of patients that actually become uh, new patients for you, and the dollars that are generated. 
Now, one of the keys to, um, to being able to improve your marketing is to understand what's happened with that marketing and what's really working effectively. And so being able to do some analysis by connecting what happened online with what happened offline is really key. And we can learn, for example, the best keyword phrases to use to target the right type of patient, the optimal days. Uh, we go through and do analysis um, to understand how Monday did versus Tuesday versus Wednesday, et cetera, um, and what the best days to spend advertising money are. The prime hours of the day, we look at every hour of the day, and we also look at the target geography to find out where we're drawing our best patients and how far we can extend. Um, there's a really interesting study recently that measured how far people will go to go to a dental office. It was about 21 minutes. But we know that there are certain services that they will drive farther for if they know that um, there's a level of expertise or special training. And one of the things that, um, that we have found is very effective is if we can connect, um, track all of the leads that come in the office and connect those to their online information, then we've got the power to be able to do this kind of analysis that'll give you the opportunity to continually improve. Now, there are a number of ways to do that tracking. You can just do a simple spreadsheet um, to track those as they come in. Um, with our doctors, we actually have a, an online tool that we use that makes that even a little easier. But if you're just trying to track within your own office, that, that's certainly an easy way to do it and uh, can get you there. And then, based on that analysis, you learn what works best for your practice and can continually improve uh, to make your dollars work harder. And that is, uh, if there is a secret sauce to making internet work, uh, marketing work, it is being able to do that tracking, to do the analysis, and then be able to go back and refine your marketing so that um, it gets better and better. So. Um, with that, I um, hope that's been helpful. We'll um, um, have some time to take a few questions. And um, let, me, uh, let me just start. I'm going to invite Rusty to help me uh, with some questions here. Here's our contact information. If by chance we don't get to all of the questions, why well, I'm um, happy to um, to talk to you later. Um, I just heard a speaker on websites at the AACD, and he made a huge point of no longer having two websites, as it actually hurt you with Google now. Um, I'll be happy to answer this one. And Rusty, if you have anything uh, to add, you know, jump in. Um, this is probably, it depends on how many websites you have and how they're used. Uh, if you're doing a large number of websites, Google has said they don't like that. Um, if you have 10 or 20 or 30 websites that are um, connected together, that will potentially start to hurt you. Um, what we're talking about here is a fairly tight um, strategy where you're uh, going in and just setting up some targeted microsites for specific services. What we find from our experience in working in dental marketing is that you will usually be able to create multiple listings this way. You can usually get a listing for your main website if it's well optimized. We find sometimes the search engines will give us an additional listing for a blog post on that same subject. And very often, we'll find that we'll get a third listing um, for a microsite. So um, our, uh, I think it probably just depends on um, how you're employing that strategy. It would make a, a big difference. Um, Rusty, maybe if you want to take this uh, next uh, question, um, what's your opinion on having a Twitter feed on your home page? 
You bet. So that's one of probably the most frequent questions we get is about social media and your online marketing efforts. And all I can speak from is our experience. And I have not seen, Lane, correct me if you've seen something different, but I have not seen any client of ours that has driven substantial business through social media channels. Now, you know, the caveat to that would be the local search. So, for instance, Google Plus has been enormously beneficial, and to, to Lane's point, um, a lot of people are using that. But as far as Twitter or Facebook, from my research and from what I see, most people, especially savvy shoppers, like to know that you have some sort of social media presence. Uh, it shows that you're put together and, and that you're representing yourself but I don't see it driving substantial business like local reviews do or like your website does or, or uh, you know, paid ads. Would you agree with that from what you've seen, Lane? Yeah, and, and I, um, I would just add this with regards to strategy. If you think about your website as primarily a tool that is going to speak to new prospects, make that your priority. So if you've got a link to Twitter or to Facebook or any other social media, I would move that down low on the page and keep your things that are relevant to new prospects on the top. I think it's, it, you know, when they see that you have some social presence, as, as Rusty said, I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. And, uh, but think about your social media as really a way to communicate primarily with your existing patients in hopes that they'll communicate with their friends, um, your website's primarily going to be targeted to new prospects. I've got one more additional comment on that, Lane, to follow exactly what you, you were saying. Uh, if there's too much of a focus on social media, you could inadvertently lose potential patients because if they see your Facebook link, they click on it to check out your Facebook page, then all of a sudden they see what their friends are up to, and then they're finding out about the party coming up on the weekend, and then what their nephews are up to, all of a sudden they're going to wander off and maybe not find their way back. Uh, would you agree with that, Lane? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It becomes a distraction, so you have to be careful of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question, a good question. Given a budget for only one between Google AdWords and Yelp paid services, do you have a go-to recommendation? Um, I would say, hands down, I would go with Google. The reason for that is your visibility on Google is going to be far broader and far better than it will be on Yelp. And um, so you're, you're far better to invest. Um, what you're doing with Google AdWords is getting your story in front of new prospects. Um, with Yelp, uh, depending on, on what you do, but you're more likely to be competing with some other um, dentists there before they get to the part where they're seeing your story and your website, and the visibility just isn't as great. So um, I think that's a far better use of your money. Um, if you are using AdWords, um, that certainly allows you with a lot of targeting to have a lot of t more precise targeting and some feedback on the keywords that are being used. The AdWords Express that they offer is, is a little more general and uh, it, perhaps a little less expensive, but not as well targeted. So hopefully that's helpful there. Um, this probably be a, a good question for Rusty. The next one is simplicity in the website a good idea, or are you seeing more complex websites working better? You know, the, the trend in design right now is very much minimalistic. Lots of white space. Let and, and again, it's back to the the bandwidth thing. You can use large, engaging images to, you know, to speak for you. One thing we say is, if an image is, you know, if if a photo is worth a thousand yards, where the video is worth a million, right? Uh, so a lot of the focus is to, to using images and video and to really strip down the little frills that you used to see on websites a while back. For instance, flash animations are no longer supported on mobile devices like iPads or iPhones or Droids. So those are being pulled off of sites. Uh, overly uh, ornate designs in the background of the site are really kind of out right now. So very minimalistic as far as design and layout, 
but heavy on the rich imagery and videos is what we're seeing being effective and modern right now. And if you ever want a good, you know, kind of litmus test for what's popular at the moment, just go to apple.com. If you go to their website, you'll see a perfect example of a huge engaging image with a few below it with, with minimal text. However, we do need to include text for search engine optimization reasons. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, uh, regarding conversion, do people expect to get a response when on a weekend? or is leaving it until first thing Monday morning okay? Um, I usually tell doctors a lot depends on how you like to run your office and um, your strategy there. It is certainly optimal to get back to people right away and respond to them quickly. You can see that um, response curve that I showed you earlier. Um, often, on the internet, people will research offices and they might pick two or three if they're coming in for major um, dental work, which they're often searching online to find someone. They, they will sometimes, you know, contact two or three offices. If you're the first one to get to them and can respond quickly, um, that can make, certainly make a difference. I know some doctors that... Hey, have, Lane, they, can... Yeah. Lane, can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Hey, uh, can I just add to that? I sure. know for a fact that in, in our office, I have the, uh, like if people contact us, and people may not want to do this, but for me it's okay. I don't mind, you know, responding to someone on the weekend. And we have had a tremendous response from people, like they'll send it Friday night at midnight. You know, and then Saturday morning I'll wake up and respond to them and just say, hey, you know, thanks for contacting us. We'd love to help you all have the ladies, you know, contact you on Monday. That's really all you need that I found you need to do. And a lot of our patients have said, gosh, if you're that responsive to me and I'm not even a patient, I know you're going to take great care of me when I get in the office. I'm definitely coming to see you. So... You know, even though it's a pain in the butt to do sometimes, and and you know, if you get back to them the same day, I think that is a tremendous advantage if you want to do it. To me, I, I'm excited to do that. I love that part of it <clears throat> to you know go the extra mile for people uh, that you haven't even you know potentially met yet. Boy, that's great! Great feedback. Thank you. Um, I have one additional question regarding reviews. Um, it says, I know it's a bit of a faux pas, but how can I encourage my patients to write Google Plus, local, and Yelp reviews for my practice? Um, this is an, an interesting question um, that we have really wrestled with. We've um, seen a number of tools tested for requesting reviews. Um, we've, we have some tools of our own that we use, and what it comes down to at the end of the day is it's a bit of a numbers game. It just requires asking a lot of people to do it. Um, if you ask uh, 20 people, um, you're going to be fortunate if you can get one or two to follow through and actually write the review. Um, one thing that helps, if you have a place where in kind of the automated process of getting reviews either through Solution Reach or Demand Force or um, through other solutions that provide those and, and load them on a website. They don't do you a lot of good there, but if you can just take those, cut and paste um, that review that they've already written and just send them a nice email and say thank you so much for um, providing this great review, would you mind going on Google or would you mind going on Yelp and um, put this review, paste this review in. That takes some of the brain damage out of it for the consumer and um, will help a little bit. But um, we have not found any magic bullet for getting this uh, done. We've seen very sophisticated uh, efforts with uh, iPads or pedestals in the mar in the office. We had one doctor that tested one uh, with a pedestal in there, and they found a way to get these on 
uh, Google, and then suddenly um, they got wise to it, and he lost a bunch of reviews that had been posted over the last year. Um, so there isn't any easy answer that I know to that other than to just ask, and you have to ask a lot of people, but make it as easy as you can for them, and uh, that'll help. All right. Um, um, additional question about Yelp. Um, let's see. Yelp has not recommended. They say it's because the reviewers are not frequent reviewers, so they've blocked them. Um, our Google and Rate MDs are there and uh, and excellent. Um, Yelp is becoming a, a real challenge uh, to work with because they they have a, a formula for reviews that they will accept and those that they won't, and um, and a lot of doctors find they have a lot of really great reviews that get screened out and they lose them. And uh, one of the things that we have found makes a big difference is whether they are active on the Yelp network. If they have friend connections and have done a number of reviews, those reviews will tend to stick better than uh, those who are going on for the first time or don't have any connections online. So um, that's uh, one thing to take a look at. Google, of course, would be the most important, uh, as you've uh, referenced here in this question. Hey, Lane, on. I just wanted to say we're you know just about out of time here but uh, if folks have other questions they're happy to uh, forward to me and I can have them posted on the uh, Coif, uh Harbor website or the answers and things and I wanted to say thank you very much to Rusty Curtis and to Lane Anderson for uh, taking their time to pre present this program to us and hopefully you guys and ladies felt like you got some good information. If you want to follow uh, through or you have more questions, I'm sure Lane and Rusty would be happy to answer any questions you have uh, and you know provide you with as much information as you need to get what you're hoping for from your website and from your practice. So thanks again, everybody, for uh, spending some time with us this evening. And uh, stay tuned for our next uh, program, which will be probably about once the people call, how do we talk to them and get them into the office. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.